Right, on we go. There's um, something very serious going on on the MeWe chat. And, um, it will get addressed. You know, you can't have people asking questions like this. Why is the Supreme Court even listening to mandates which are not laws? I mean, come on now. That is rampant common sense. You can't be exhibiting common sense. I've told you that. Seriously. <laughs> the show that teaches common sense. Well, I never. An alleged technical glitch in Israel's state archives revealed some very interesting pieces. Um, David Ben Gurion called for Palestinian villages to be wiped out. And the Israeli state archive website also revealed that a prominent Israeli politician said in 1948 that he could forgive instances of rape committed against Palestinian women in the violence that preceded the founding of the Israeli state, according to Haaretz. Actually, it's still going on, courtesy of the IDF. But Aaron Zizling who would later serve as agriculture minister, made the remarks during a provisional government meeting discussing the war that led to Israel's creation. Creation being the operative word. And he said, let us, let us say that instances of rape occurred in Ramla. I can forgive instances of rape, but I will not forgive other acts. He's quoted as saying, all very Talmudic, that I have to say. Now, during the events that began in 1948 and are known to Palestinians as the Nakba, or catastrophe, when Israeli soldiers killed an estimated 15,000 Palestinians and forced three quarters of a million from their homeland. And the world sat by and watched it. Does that make sense? No. Nope. And it's a program then, isn't it? But was this a technical glitch or further evidence that the truth leaks out now at key points? It is something that will sound familiar. As we always say, his story always repeats. People are forbidden to go to restaurants, cafes, theatres, cinemas, concerts, museums, sporting events or other similar ventures. And that has been done to us in the past two years as we all know. Except that was a list from the Nazis to the Jews on July the 8th, 1942. Oops. The Daily Wire correspondent Matt Walsh this week was banned from Twitter for his what is now declared hate speech. And he said this, The greatest female Jeopardy champion of all time is a man. The top female college swimmer is a man. The first female four-star admiral in the public health service is a man. Men have dominated female high school track and the female MMA circuit. All facts. But in the weak, woke, child mild world of social media, facts and truth is now declared a hate speech. <laughs> Remember in the movie show we did for Christmas 
we mentioned the repeated pattern of the three women. And right on cue, it seems, on January 1st, three women were killed in France, allegedly by a partner or ex-partner in what the feminist campaigners described as an unbearable start to another year's tally of violence. Now, I'm not casting doubt on whether these events unfolded or not. But why mention it in the news? And more importantly, why mention when it reached that figure? Because like two weeks, it is spellcasting. Three witches of Eastwick, we went through it all. Here's a social and cultural thing to consider. In fact, the next two pieces are all about culture. But footballers, or soccer players, as you would say here, who play for China's national team, have now been banned from getting any tattoos and advised to remove the ones they, they have under a new directive. And the country's sports administration body said recruiting new players with tattoos at national level and to youth squads was strictly prohibited. And the administration said the move would help set a good example for society. Now, China has been increasingly stepping up regulations since mid-2018 to stop tattoos being shown on TV screens. And some professional footballers have since been covering their arms with long sleeves to hide their body art. But in a statement, the country's general administration of sport said national players with tattoos were advised to have them removed altogether. Now, in Chinese culture, a stigma has been attached to tattoos because in the past they were used to brand criminals and the tattoo still has links to organised crime groups in East Asia. The triad and all those people. And also, tattoos among ethnic groups were often seen as a mark of the uncivilised. It's an interesting story. Now, personally, I am against tattoos. I think they look ugly and they are covering up inner issues. But that's my opinion. That does not mean I don't believe others should not have the freedom of choice to do so. But the issue here is children getting them. And personally... I would make a rule that no person under the age of 25 can get a tattoo. Why? Because of the peer pressure, the desire to fit in. People are doing things not of their own choice, but because it's cool to be with the in crowd. And by making it a rule of 25 and over for tattoos, that negates that issue and people at 25 can make a more adult-based decision, which is debatable amongst many, but there you go. But the one thing about tattoos that people don't think about is, how can you be religious and have a tattoo? Is that not going against your God? By saying my body is not good enough and so I have to adorn it. Think about that. But whilst it's nice to see the Chinese addressing cultural issues. As remember last year they gave kids a set time for using online video games. It was three hours a week I think. They also removed effeminate males from being TV models. And they are all very valid addresses to make. But one hopes they stick to addressing issues like these and not go full authoritarian on it. So having done that piece, 
I thought it perhaps we need to look at the cultural issues in the Western world, although it has spread into other regions with internet access. But this is one of the biggest problems we face is the changing what is the frankly ugly culture with having currently with online influence all done by think tanks via social media. The what is known as the look at me culture and the attention seeking whores. Living all of our lives online is turning us into vapid, self-possessed, wannabe influencers, snapping, pouting and liking our way into cultural oblivion where real life passes us by. Narcissism and vanity are on the rise and while in the past these were considered vices, we must concede that today in our downward hurting dystopia, these are now positively virtues. There is no longer any moral opposition to anything that might stand in the way of a more impressive selfie. Fake teeth, fake smiles, duck face, caked orange layers of fake tan and the endless personal portrait photos captured during every imaginable life situation compromise what we must refer to as the new Instagram culture. But these captures, these endless streams of vignettes, are not real life. Instead, they are the vain mirror of the wished life. What they want to be, not what they are. And the showy artefacts of those endlessly seeking to impress whether they are actually doing anything eventful or not. And yet I wonder whether if some of them use a mirror for critical analysis. Given the dress code, inappropriate clothes for the size of the body and the classic trout pout due to Botox, who said that look is appealing? Because frankly it looks ugly and it's the equivalent of kissing a snake-headed fish. It looks bizarre and ugly. And quite what females see in that is beyond me. It completely distorts their face. But this is the world of banal fashion designers who dictate what is fashion and what is not. All appealing to the I must fit in elements of society or worse... I want to look like a celebrity. And quite frankly, they are the worst role models ever to follow. Sold out vacuous cretins, riddled with fake everything. Now social media, particularly Instagram it seems, have been performing an enormously influential social experiment affecting fashion, personal relations, dating, employment, politics and how we think of ourselves. The way we view and live life is altered by the prism of reflection. Everyone is watching everybody else, except themselves. However, despite the rise of this publicly sanctioned narcissism, in reality vanity remains a vice, a negative even dangerous indulgence both socially and also individually. There's no world, online or otherwise, where vanity is not sensibly considered a destructive trait. For it engenders inflated opinions, bragging, jealousy, dishonesty, false representation and ultimately the unthinking egomania of the tyrannical. And whilst we're all vain to a certain degree, restraint or balance is required in all things, prosperity, health and a good life. But today, every banal facet of a personal life must now be captured, categorised and glamorised. 
and the obsession leads to fantastic feats of modification, such as the trend in getting veneers, where your real teeth are filed down to weird, jagged tombstones so that you can have the Hollywood smile. That is often performed by a man in Turkey or Mexico if you're in America at an irresistible price. And why not get gastric sleeve surgery to boot since you are going abroad? And this vanity feeds into the phenomenon of the Instagram fashion based on the premise that every single person is potentially a celebrity, an influence, influencer, therefore every single person must also have designer brands. It's keeping up with the Joneses again, isn't it? The debt cycle. Where previously designer brands were art houses or fashion think tanks providing haute couture, now the influencer with the most followers controls what becomes fashionable. And the discriminatory standards of cutting edge aesthetics are then traded for a mass consumerism of real and knockoff labels. And thereby the fashions themselves are largely crass, bawdy, and mostly vehicles to display ever larger brand logos as wealth symbols, as with all things related to vanity and superficiality rules. It's all fake. And life is no longer so much lived as it is recorded. And it's not even recorded in its wart and all honesty either. Like a documentary for posterity, but in social simulation of itself. The individual is a hero playing a part in their own life movie. But even this is not strictly true either as we live in a post-reality TV world where we seldom think in a framework of storytelling or view our lives related to a classic narrative so much as an impression or vignette of everyone else's personal life and their social relations. And this strange alteration in worldview is only increasing in scope with the younger generations with the apparent loss of parents' ability to allow kids to be bored, many children are now no longer growing up with a storytelling or a narrative framework. We don't teach the children. And instead of watching films, they are entertained with tablets providing a limitless supply of YouTube package opening videos in a kind of monotone brainwashing of meaningless sensation. It's all drivel. And there are kids as young as 10 going into school with fake eyelashes, fake tan and false nails. None of whom can pose for a photo without doing duck lips. And it's so endemic that some some schools need to adopt policies in direct prevention of it. And for young adults there seems to be a mania of makeup tutorial videos. Makeup itself having become a science requiring intense variety of paraphernalia, highlighter, primer, contour sticks and all manner of related items. But also it's no longer just for women, is it? The feminization of the Western male is no secret. And it kind of is openly lauded as a triumph. And the reasons for its victory over many thousands of years of guiding patriarchy have many possible sources. The feminist policies, the lack of male role models, the overuse of plastics 
and the lowering of testosterone from overuse of soy in commercial food. But what is perhaps most disturbing about the narcissism trend is just how much these influencers and worse the hordes of influencer wannabes begin to resemble the sterile beautiful ones from the John B. Calhoun's Mouse Utopia experiment. Now Calhoun enclosed four pairs of mice in a large pen complete with all imaginable mouse amenities, water dispensers, limitless food, nesting boxes and a total absence of predators. And he was quoted as saying of this utopia, I largely speak of mice, but my thoughts are on man. And while the mice initially prospered and were fertile, after 600 days with still enough space to double their numbers, they began to decline until the entire colony went extinct. And it appeared that without predators or want, or even the need to acquire their own resources, they simply lost the will to carry on. The young mice that were born never learned the skills for survival, and along with that, seemingly forgot how to live. And among the aberrations and breakdowns in social norms that occurred in that process was the phenomenon of the beautiful ones who spent all their time grooming and sleeping. And they were the ultimate personification of life without hardship or struggle. And while being more beautiful than ever, they lost all interest in reproductive sex and died out. And so it's not so utopian after all. So what is the lesson for us all in this grim and familiar analogy it is this when abundant luxury removes challenge and responsibility self extinction is not far away so carry on pursing those lips and get your phone out because people are watching but ultimately you're leading yourself to your own extinction And this is what we are reversing with the TPC. No longer should you be a passive observer admiring others who do the work, or in many cases, critiquing the few who do do the work. We have to all play a role and avoid becoming the mouse utopia. Vanity, narcissism, comparative and competitive over the wrong things in life must give way to personal improvement on the inside, not the external. A desire then to help others without attaching it to yourself for external gratification and the desire to be a part of the change by doing and not observing others doing. The CCP, Chinese Communist Party, this made me laugh, this piece. I know you will all go back to a show from two and a half years ago. Has developed an artificial intelligence prosecutor that can identify and suggest charges for alleged crimes including dissent and provoking trouble. And it was built by the Shanghai Pudong People's Procuratorate. And the tool can file charges after hearing a verbal description of the case. And it runs on a standard desktop computer and presses charges based on 1,000 traits from the human-generated case description text. (laughs) 
and the prosecutor was programmed with information from 17,000 real-life cases ranging from 2015. Oh, how interesting that is, 2015. <laughs> I didn't realise when I first read this story. But the AI goes from 2015 to 2020. Funny that. And can identify and, as a result, compress charges for the eight most common crimes in Shanghai. And among the charges is provoking trouble. There's that broad language again. Which is a term often weaponized by Beijing to stifle political and social dissent and criticism. Like the National Security Act then. And other crimes reportedly recognised by the machine are obstructing official duties, credit card fraud, gambling crimes, dangerous driving, theft, fraud and intentional injury. And the Chinese prosecutors, however, have raised concerns, well I never, <laughs> over the machine's purported accuracy and the accuracy of 97% may be high from a technological point of view, they said, but there will always be a chance of a mistake, cautioned a prosecutor from the Guangdong province. <laughs> and what about all the people who are in jail through various mistakes who were targeted individuals? So 97% is not bad, actually. So, who will take responsibility when it happens? The prosecutor, the machine, or the designer of the algorithm? Now, a more advanced version of the prosecutor will eventually be able to eliminate data irrelevant to a case and will be capable of converting spoken words into a standard format computers can understand and also act upon. Now, the CCP has increasingly relied on artificial intelligence to implement its social credit score system. Well, I never. Using the COVID-19 pandemic as a pretext to implement vaccine passports. Well, I never again. And it has been revealed that the pharmaceutical giant, Pfizer, has partnered with Alipay, the regime's premier platform for its social credit scoring system, one year ahead of the onset of the pandemic. Proving COVID was the driver of a pre-planned database system, as I warned in the Clowns in Panic show. And perhaps COVID means cover for ID. Now a social credit score will be based on whether you bow to the authorities or not. That's what it means. And the COVID narrative has shown us that. Do as the government says or be banned from living your life. The next stage in their world is an all digital world. Don't follow their orders and access to your social score and digital currency will be shut off. And in essence, they will fully run and control your life. What you eat, drink, when you sleep, when you have sex, brush your teeth or bathe. All of it monitored. And I mean all of it. In fact, that technology is already here. They were going to implement it into the digital city homes. It's not like they haven't told us. And like I've said for a number of years now, they are going to replace all the key roles in society with robots or machines. I warn the military, the agencies, the police and others. But now they're going into the legal aspects. And if that takes off, there goes all your spy agencies. <laughs> And I know they've done dog robots for policing. 
But wouldn't it be the height of irony if they'd replaced intelligence agencies with cats? <laughs> what comes next? Robot governments? In essence, we've had that since 1871. Will there be any jobs left? Is that why there is a Delete Humans program going on? Or are they humans at all? Have you defined human? What is human? <laughs>